We'll dive in. I uh, thought we would start with just a real simple kind of go around, uh, let everyone know who's at the table here. And as we go around, if folks wouldn't mind just giving a word or two about maybe why uh, you decided to come to democracy school. Uh, it's always kind of interesting to know, uh, you know, the reasons for why people show up to these, these schools. We've been doing these now for well, I think over 10, 12 years at this point, uh, all over the country. Uh, so uh, this is probably in the neighborhood of maybe <coughs> the 15th or 16th school to be taught here in Spokane. Uh, they first started in uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, 2005. 2005. Um, but it's been a while since we've uh, had one here in Spokane, so it's great to, to finally do another one <laughs> in Spokane. Um, so we're going to have you guys kind of go around, introduce yourselves, and then we'll introduce ourselves to you. Um, we can start uh, maybe here. And before I even do that, um, I don't know if you've noticed microphones and cameras. Uh, these folks are from the Department of Homeland Security, and they're going to... No. Um, this is uh, Joe and Rosie. They're local film producers here in Spokane. Uh, they're actually going to record the Democracy School this weekend. Uh, we've had an online version up on the website for some time, and it's time to update it. Uh, so the idea is to capture footage from this school and then uh, uh, produce it at a later date to then put online. So if people can't physically get together, they can take the school watching it online. So they're going to record. Uh, if anyone doesn't want themselves on video, uh, please let me know. Uh, so that can be noted as they're going into uh, post-production stuff that they can make sure that you are uh, either not physically in the screen or one of those sort of make your face look like it's melted uh, scenarios. So. so that's why they're here. Um, so just to let you know in case you were wondering. Um, well, with that, if we could start with, uh, you know, quick welcomes of everybody and then we'll get into an outline of what we'll get into tonight uh, and then a little bit of an introduction to the school itself and then we'll dive into the actual curriculum. Does everyone have a, a big book in front of them? Okay, that's the curriculum. The other newspaper thing is uh, sort of a brochure of sorts about community rights uh, that the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund puts out. Uh, gives you kind of a working overview of of uh, really what uh, this work has come to be. Uh, also some examples of places where this work is happening. And that's for you to take. I've also got extra copies if you want to take some with you tonight or tomorrow or whatever it may be. All right, so with that, um, Michelle, would you mind um, starting just saying, uh, again, your name and maybe a, a word or two about why you're uh, at Democracy School? Um, my name's Michelle, and I've always been kind of dabbling in, um, you know, ecology and nature rights and now that my daughter has grown and at college and all my Girl Scouts have grown up and graduated, I got lots of time on my hands so I decided to get more involved. Great. My name is Jerry LeClaire. I'm a retired surgeon in the community. I uh, was blissfully reading National Geographic and uh, listening to NPR when an election occurred in November. <laughs> and uh, I've been panicked since then, and I've been writing an email and organizing under the principles of Indivisible since then. Uh, and this came up and it looked like it might be interesting. My name's Marge Andrews. I've lived in Spokane about uh, 17 years. I teach Spanish at Eastern. And um, I, when I talk to someone who supports uh, Trump, I, I lose my my speech, I just, you know, I mean, when they say the earth is flat, where do you go from there? So I want to become more informed and become more involved. I don't feel quite so helpless and maybe get some talking points. Thank you. Uh, my name is Norbert Luke. I'm, I'm a retired military educator. And um, I'm an independent voter, always have been. And <clears throat> I just felt like uh, maybe this is the time I need to get involved and start speaking out. And so uh, I thought this was a great place to start building that foundation. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Waveday. I retired after 28 years of the Department of Ecology here in Washington State and uh, last year and thought I was going to be retired. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like that's not an option anymore. Like Jerry, I was 
just stupefied at some of the nonsense that started coming out of the Washington, D.C. media shortly after inauguration and continued to be stupefied. But I'm here because um, I want to, there are so many organizations now that are rising up and, and from Move On, Indivisible, heck my trout fishing club, everybody <laughs> wants to rise up and do something and I tried to think of how, what's the most effective avenue for me? Well, I was a, before I was a state bureaucrat in environmental agency, I was a journalist, so I, I thought what I'd like to do is maybe lend those skills targeted at something that I know something about, like the environment. So I wanted to kind of get here and, and help prepare myself with a tool chest so I could be a more productive contributor to uh, the resistance movement. Great, thank you. I'm Dina Romoff, and um, I was uh, busy doing a lot of drugs in high school, so I never paid attention to all the classes on um, the government. And I've always been a more action person than a kind of like, let's go about this a more, you know, political way or right way or dealing with And so now I'm involved and I figured I better broaden my knowledge base Thank you. Hello, my name is Anthony. I'm a Spokane native, and I'm sort of a, probably the youngest person in the room, so this person. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of looking for ways to get involved as a millennial and trying to trying to get progressive priorities implemented at this local, state, and federal level. And I'm just trying to figure out ways to do that. So maybe I figure this would be the best way to do it. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Howdy. Mm -hmm. Uh, my name is Christine, and I'm pretty much on board with them as a millennial, and I feel like I have a lot to prove. Um, I was pretty dumbfounded by the election. I was never really into politics until the election rolled around this year, and it hit me so suddenly and so hard that I felt like I had no choice but to be involved. And so I'm here today to broaden my horizons. Um, I'm trying to shift my career focus into um, my name is Mary Jackson, and I'm new to the Washington State um, via Texas. Um, I, I was active there with some Planned Parenthood shenanigans that got passed. Um, and also, I think PTSD, and I repeatedly get fired and have some free time right now, and I'm employed. <laughs> so I thought this would be a good way of expressing myself against the self care. Um, and, and I am very much interested. I, I do find that with the election, um, there's kind of this wave of uh, um, denial, and then I don't think we've gotten to the acceptance phase. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do. I want to become more active. I think it's important, especially with everything going on, and, and to meet people in Washington State. So. Great. Um, I'm Camp Davies. Uh, been in Spokane, I don't know, 30 years or so. Um, I am semi-retired from working in public schools and special ed, and I'm part of the local indivisible group, and I just want to know how we can, I'm here to learn how to defend democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvia Oliver, retired uh, university, um, and Pam and I are both on Spokane Invisible, uh, just a small group of women that decided to get out there and do what we could do. And same thing, it's just, it's just it's like getting into the weeds and finding out as much as we can about everything related to democracy so that we can better defend democracy. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Earl Elias. I'm a retired truck driver. We just retired up here from Oregon because we grew up here, but uh, uh, I don't know what to tell you about myself. Uh, unlike this young lady, I uh, uh, used to uh, use uh, civics class to catch up on my uh, sleep debt. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I wish I could pay more attention. Uh, I had an epiphany about in 96 uh, uh, when Ronnie Duggar uh, wrote a 
piece in the Nation magazine, and I uh, started getting involved with a group called Alliance for Democracy, and uh, that led me to uh, uh, Pock Lab, a program on corporations, law, and democracy, uh, reading their stuff, and uh, I came in contact with uh, CELDF and also, and uh, they do some really impressive stuff, and uh, uh, eventually the Alliance for Democracy in, in Portland, they kind of worked and they moved to amend, because uh, after uh, the Citizens United decision, uh, everybody wanted to do something, because something had to be done. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, this past election was another epiphany. You know, I, I just couldn't imagine something like that happening here in this uh, shining city on the hill, uh, the electoral system we've got. I, I, I still can't believe it. I wake up every morning <laughs> from a, a nightmare. And uh, the, the, only, the only salvation is he's, he's doing exactly what he said he was going to do. Yeah. And nobody, nobody thought he was serious, or I he's serious now. He has to be stopped. And uh, the other thing, I, I keep waiting for democracy to, <clears throat> to do yeah. something. And a lot of writers have claimed that we, we've got enough democracy, we're just not using it. And uh, uh, another democracy quote I like was from Winston Churchill. He said, uh, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute chat with the average voter. <laughs> I'm to find out what, what can be done about uh, what's, what's coming up. <laughs> Maurice, we just had everyone just introduce themselves and a word or two about why they decided to come to the school. So, my name is Morris Robinette, uh, third generation rancher, south part of the county. And I heard about CELF uh, at a permaculture conference I was at three years ago. <laughs> and I was fascinated by what I learned there. And, uh, I've been following it ever since, and, and this is the third one of these meetings I've been in and where people say, why are you here, what do you want to do, uh, in the last month, so, uh, more of the same. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kai Hushka, I'm an organizer actually with the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, so I work with communities in Washington State, Oregon, Northwest Area, uh, Hawaii, I've worked in Hawaii with some communities there in the past. I'm one of the lecturers for the democracy schools uh, and also have been part of the community rights work here in Spokane since 2008. Um, so I'm going to be one of the lecturers here for the school and then joining me is uh, Brad Reed. Uh, my name is Brad and I um, am a high school English teacher by day. Um, I don't do this at night but that's kind of what the way the joke runs. Um, and I went to uh, the first democracy school in Spokane, which was in July of 2005. And since that moment, have had my axis of activism reoriented. Um, I had spent from 1982 when I graduated college to 2005 um, mm -hmm. doing a lot of um, the kind of work that I would imagine all of us have been involved in. Um, working on a variety of issues and advocating for social justice internationally and nationally. Um, and so in 2006, no, 2007, um, went to be trained to teach the schools. Um, I don't know how many I've taught now. Kai and I have done this several times. Um, and so we've been doing schools in Spokane since July of 2005. Um, and to Earl's and Dina's comments about civics class, um, Having been through this, having gone through it as a student and gone through it several times as a teacher, um, this is not stuff that you missed. So if you were catching up on napping or doing too many drugs, you didn't miss anything because this stuff was not in civics because that's what I discovered um, when I went through it and the more I've read it and the more I've you know, prepared to teach it. So um, for me, it was a life-changing experience to kind of reorient the way I approach how to make a difference in the world. And then the third person up here with us is Thomas Lindsay. He'll be here tonight for a little bit and then possibly uh, tomorrow. Do you want to introduce yourself, Thomas? Uh, making a cameo appearance tonight and tomorrow, uh, as Kai mentioned. I'm, the, I'm an attorney and the executive director of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And I have the dubious honor of being the first lecturer of the Democracy School ever, uh, which uh, began in 2004. And I'm going to talk more about that in a couple minutes. 
And then uh, Brad's going to take some time here just to kind of run through the roadmap of the school so we get a better sense about what we're going to cover tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and then as Thomas said, he'll talk a little bit more about sort of why the school came to be and how this work has evolved from where it started. So what you will find in this uh, big thick book in front of you is uh, a very, it looks like a lot, but it's a kind of a quick and dirty uh, primer. The first school that I went through in 2005 was Friday evening like tonight, all day Saturday, and then six hours on Sunday. Um, it was more intensive, more, more time intensive. Uh, we've, we've condensed it down to tonight, uh, one Friday evening and Saturday. And the blue pages um, mark the divisions in the sections. Um, section A, B, C, and D, if you can see it, are up on the, on the poster up here, kind of the overall themes. Uh, what, the, what the school does is to try to, to explain and deconstruct uh, the nature of where law came from in this country. Um, and so we, we spend some time in um, section B going back to look at the creation and replication of the English structure of law. Tonight, before we get back into the history, um, is kind of the, the roadmap of how conventional organizing works within the, what, we are, what we call the regulatory system, um, where there are regulations, there are rules that people lobby for to get change made, um, and how the the story, the evolving story of the Legal Defense Fund came up against that and the discovery was we have to find a new way to organize because when you work inside the regulatory system, you don't actually get what you want, you get what they allow you to get. That's, that will be our focus tonight. Um, we talk about uh, people's movements throughout history, the American revolutionaries, the suffragists, the abolitionists. Um, and their willingness to change law by challenging existing law and disobeying it. Um, and then we end um, with, because the way the system works, and I'm guessing from all that you shared in your, in your brief um, mini biographies, you know how this works. When there are gains made on behalf of people and democracy, the system snaps back and pulls power back to make sure it's still consolidated in the right very few hands. Um, and so we will end tomorrow with having gone through looking at all the deconstruction and the history and the, the brutal history of colonialism and exploitation. Um, and then, then we'll have lunch after you're completely sad. Um, and then we'll spend some time looking at how people throughout history and in the last 10 to 12 years in their local communities have risen up to say, we're not gonna stand for that, we wanna create something new. So, um, the, in the beginning, the schools in Spokane were, um, I think, designed for general information sharing, kind of overall activist edification. Um, they led, in the first three years in Spokane, to the foundation of the group called Envision Spokane. Uh, which was about getting ballot initiatives on the ballot to actually change functioning law in Spokane. And so the more we do these, the more we have tried to say, let's, let's at the end of the school, let's have it go somewhere to real work on the ground in Spokane. Um, and so we're hoping that, that people will get excited about what they hear, as depressing as it will get, um, and realize that there's possibility in this kind of work and how to engage in efforts that are already unfolding in Spokane. Oh, should I give it to Tom? Okay. And for those who came late, um, we're recording this school to be used for online purposes in the future. And so um, if you have problems with being on camera at some point, let me know and we'll make note of it. All right, let's rock and roll. Um, so the schools are called democracy schools, but they might as well be called why do we not have democracy schools? <clears throat> and so they're intended to be an exploration of the system to show how we really lack democratic governing authority at the local level over a bunch of different things like energy decisions and agribusiness decisions and those types of things. 
My role tonight is to give you a, a little bit of background about where the democracy school came from. So, we, so you can put it in some kind of context about how we evolved because we didn't start taking on some of the largest corporations in the United States just because it was fun uh, or decided to on a Wednesday morning to do that. We did it because we evolved through a series of steps. And those steps began way back in 1995. So we're gonna reverse everything back out 22 years back to 1995 uh, when I was in my third year of law school. And I went to law school at a little place called Widener Law School in central Pennsylvania. And uh, our third year of law school, uh, myself and two others who were dedicated to doing public interest law of some kind when we graduated, were approached by a bunch of communities from across Pennsylvania, mostly in middle part of the state, known as the rural T. So in Pennsylvania, you have Pittsburgh on one side, Philadelphia on the other, uh, and as uh, James Carville used to say, Mississippi in the middle. Uh, so if you're running for office in Pennsylvania statewide and you win Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, you don't need to set foot campaign-wise in any other part of the state because that's where the population centers are. So uh, in that middle part of the state, uh, which is the area that gets all the toxic waste incinerators and the factory farms, uh, basically any of the nasty stuff that has to go someplace that doesn't go next to the uh, McMansions in suburban Philadelphia ends up in rural Pennsylvania in this rural T. And so as third year law students, we uh, got a bunch of phone calls and uh, visits from people in community organizations who are in that middle part of the rural part of the state of Pennsylvania who were asking us to help them because they had something coming into the community. Could have been a toxic waste incinerator, could have been a landfill, factory farm, a frack well, uh, some kind of energy extraction project, you name it, one of the thousands of different single uh, projects that invade communities on a weekly basis across the United States. And these folks were coming to us for no magic reason except that they couldn't afford lawyers. Uh, today, some of my peers, at least on the corporate side of the law, uh, who do corporate environmental law, make upwards of about $2,000 an hour. So if you're a community organization, you're faced with a corporate project coming in and you have a permit that needs to be reviewed uh, or you want to talk to a lawyer and ask some questions, that most of the community organizations out there don't have two dimes to rub together, let alone the ability to write a check for a lawyer to come in and represent them. So they were coming to us as law students, to which we had to explain to them that as law students, it was illegal for us to practice law on their behalf. Uh, and that, uh, in, in effect, we could help them with general stuff, but we couldn't represent them because we hadn't passed the bar yet. So during that period of time, we essentially saw a need that was not filled, uh, and that needed to be filled, which was, uh, we framed the problem as not enough lawyers. There, there weren't enough lawyers to assist folks because in the United States then, as well as today, the statistics are pretty much the same, there are only 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers in the United States today. 200 full-time public interest environmental lawyers in the entire country. And so again, we framed the problem as not, not enough lawyers, and so we decided to add a couple more. So we created the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which is the host of the democracy schools. The intent of the Legal Defense Fund from 1995 to about 2001, 2002 was to do something that seemed pretty simple, which was to provide free legal services uh, to conservation-oriented community groups. So if you were in a neighborhood group that was fighting a pig farm or a, a toxic waste incinerator or something that was coming into the community, uh, we offered to represent you for free uh, to appeal permits and to do the work that environmental lawyers do. Uh, needless to say, as soon as we hung out our shingle, uh, and because free legal services are hard to come by even today, uh, that uh, people lined up around the block and our phones started ringing off the hook, and eventually we were servicing about 300 community organizations in the central part of Pennsylvania, uh, fighting a litany of different projects that these communities uh, didn't want. Uh, and our representation would usually begin the exact same way, uh, which was a phone call from the community, and somebody from the community would say, hey, we have a proposed toxic waste incinerator coming into our community, we don't want it. Uh, we want to say no to it, because our definition of a sustainable community doesn't include a toxic waste incinerator in the middle of it. And we would have to explain to folks over the phone that unfortunately in the United States, and it's the same law today as it was then, and the law then was the same as it was 100 years before that time, 
that the law in the United States, black letter, well-settled law in the US, is that you living in a municipal community, a town, a village, a county, uh, township, you name it, whatever that municipality would be, uh, are actually prohibited from banning any legal uses. Okay, so I'm gonna say it again, because usually this is the first big surprise in democracy school. Some people have run into this before, others haven't. Uh, but that if a corporation gets a permit from the state or the federal government to operate, like a, a frack company, uh, energy company that wants to do hydrofracking for natural gas, gets a permit from the state or federal government to do something, that that use becomes a legal use, L-E-G-A-L. And the law in the United States is that at the community level, at the municipal level, that your municipality is banned from prohibiting a legal use. Okay? So if something's been deemed a legal use, and legal uses have ranged from everything from low level uh, nuclear waste disposal facilities to frack wells to toxic waste incinerators, uh, you name it, across the board, uh, anything that's defined as a legal use, that your community is prohibited from banning that use. And yeah, question. Banning or it, does that include regulating? It may include regulating, depending on what the state preemptive law is. In I'm, I'm thinking like in, in Spokane County, there are municipalities that say they want to regulate the sale of marijuana, even though it's a permitted use. Yes. To operate. So yeah, you get into distinctions between the various issue areas, but let's say, just to be practical, that the city of Spokane wanted to ban big box stores. Uh, the city of Spokane, the Spokane Council, wanted to pass a one paragraph ordinance to ban big box stores. Well, what happened next is that the big box stores would sue the community. They would sue the municipality over that law, contending that their corporate constitutional rights have been violated by the actions of the city. So this course is about peeling back what all that means, like the gibberish that I just said in the last four seconds. <laughs> you know, what is a corporation? We think we know, we may not. We're gonna, you know, folks, are, these guys are gonna get into that. What are corporate constitutional rights? Why do they matter? You know, corporations having personhood and all that kind of stuff that we talk about. The corporations have rights in the United States. What does that mean? How do those rights affect you? Why are they not simply abstract rights, but that they can be used to overturn what you do within your own municipality? Those are the types of questions that the democracy school set up to explore. So going back to 1995, these calls would come into the community and they would say, well, we want to say no to this thing coming in. And we would put our lawyer hat on feeling very bright and smart and all those good things when you're that young and stupid. And you would say to the community, well, we're sorry, you can't ban it because that violates the law and you'd get sued. But what you can do is appeal the permit. So most of these facilities would have a permit issued from either their state environmental agency or from the federal government. The job of environmental lawyers over the past 40 years has been to take corporate permit applications you know, that hefty, you know, 500,000 page permit application, sit in, you know, a dim or well lit room uh, and compare that against the regulations that are in place that govern the issuance of the permit that's been applied for by the corporation. That's what environmental lawyers do. We did that for seven years. For seven years we did that work. And not surprisingly, perhaps, that when you compare the corporate permit application with the regulations under which they're supposed to issue, that you find some things missing. So, for example, in Pennsylvania, to be very practical, uh, for toxic waste incinerators, you have to post a bond of a certain amount for the roads that are feeding the toxic waste incinerator to make sure the roads don't break. <coughs> in Pennsylvania, that bond used to be $100,000 uh, for certain facilities. We would go through the corporate permit application, lo and behold, there wouldn't be a $100,000 bond, there'd be a $50,000 bond. Or the regulations would require the president to assign the permit application, but when we were reviewing it, we would find that the secretary had signed the permit application, not the president. Or there needed to be a macro uh, invertebrate water study attached to the permit application. And the one that had been attached to the permit application was old, it was outdated, and so needed to be a newer study that was attached to the application. And on behalf of the community group, we would walk into courts and we would argue to the judge, the Ministry of Law judge or others, we would say, Your Honor, the state environmental agency, they screwed up. They never should have issued this permit for this facility because it was missing something. It was missing one of these things. And so our arguments in front of the judge would be, Your Honor, under section little two, little c, little d, little i, little roman numeral two, little e, little two, little i, little c, 
that that piece was missing from the permit application. And therefore, the state agency erred. They abused their discretion in issuing the permit when they shouldn't have. Nine times out of 10, the judge would agree with us. He'd say, you're right, it's missing this piece, never should have issued, the state agency made a mistake, and I'm going to revoke the permit. Uh, to which the community group would then essentially have a victory party, right? So one of the community members would host a victory party back at their house and they'd say, we won. We, we, you know, we found a lawyer, spoke halfway intelligently, we knew we had appeal grounds, we made those arguments, the judge held in our favor, and now we're not going to get the toxic waste incident. Right? So what would happen next? The corporation would come back. The they would amend the permit and they would try to fill some of the gaps, omissions, or deficiency that we had found in the permit application. And in fact, at some of the hearings that we were at, taking on some of the country's biggest corporations, like Chemical Waste Management, was one of the companies that we took on for a number of years, that their lawyers would come up to us after the hearing that we had won and thank us for finding the gaps, <laughs> omissions, and deficiencies, because then they could bill the corporation for more hours to work to fix the gaps and deficiencies that we had found with the permit application. So like a free period. Yes. Yes. Essentially, we came to the conclusion that we were helping corporations build better permit applications. That's what we were doing. And I simplify all this down tonight because a lot of these battles are 9, 10, 15 rounds. Uh, and the reason for that, is, and the reason why we were winning those rounds, was not because we were silver tongue lawyers, it's just the fact that 95% of permits issued in the United States are never appealed. Because communities don't have the resources to do it. So most of the permits just issue, there's no appeals. Uh, we came in, sometimes showing up as half the, half the battle, uh, and we were able to find these small things that we were able to get the permits uh, reversed uh, over. At the victory party, of course, people thought the system worked, right? Until the next round came back and the corporation would fill in the, the dots or the spaces that we had found that needed to be filled. And the community group would come back to us and they'd say, Mr. Lindsay, we need you to do that jujitsu again that you did the first time around we, to, to get rid of this permit. And we would look back at them and we would say, we're sorry, but there's nothing we can do anymore because there's no leverage points. We have no leverage left because they've satisfied the regulatory system. They've satisfied the regulatory structure and there's nothing else that we can do for you. It was at that time that I learned a couple more troubling things about the regulatory system. And keep in mind, this is how environmental protection has been done for the past 40 years, is through these regulatory structures. Uh, and in fact, the argument uh, has mostly been confined between liberal and conservative to do we regulate more or do we regulate less? without actually questioning how the regulatory system functions, which is the focus of tonight, that these guys are gonna take you through the regulatory system, how it actually functions. The small things that we learned that upset our apple cart and about how the system of law is actually practiced around environmental issues is that one thing I hadn't learned in law school is that we thought at least we were costing the corporations money that the companies when they came in to defend the permit issuance, that it was costing them money to hire the lawyers and go through that process. It was then we learned that the monies that the corporations were spending on the permit defense is tax deductible under the law as a reasonable and necessary business expense under the tax code, that they could actually write those costs off. And the second thing that struck me during that period of time was something that someone said, who was a lot smarter than I was at the time, she said, the only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists. Environmentalists. The only thing that environmental regulations regulate are environmentalists, because they make us predictable as to how we fight. And even though we don't admit it a lot of the times, it's the regulated industry that's actually writing the regulatory structure. It's not normal average people who are affected by that regulatory structure generally who are writing those regulations. So in the agricultural field, and I worked in the Pennsylvania legislature for a while, you would, you would watch the agribusiness corporations write the regulations and hand them off to the Senate Ag Committee or the House Ag Committee to pass it through the system or to be promulgated through the regulatory process. And so the very corporations that are supposed to be regulated by the regulations ostensibly are the folks writing them. 
And if we think that the folks writing those regulations are going to give us in our communities at the city, village, township, county level any power to actually say no to those facilities coming in, then we're the crazy ones. Because we're trying to use a script that's been written for us before we even arrive at the scene, and then we think we can use that script to actually win the day. And that's insanity. You know, that's the conclusion that we came to. So what happened to us, this little old law firm called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund? Well, we determined that we had better things to do than help corporations write better permit applications. So we actually decided to close the office down, close the organization down, because uh, we thought we could do better other ways than helping to be a cog in that process. It was about the time that we were shutting down the office that a new string of phone calls started coming into the office, and these were from rural elected officials in south central Pennsylvania who were beginning to fight factory farms coming into the state. So these huge corporate hog factory farms. You know, anywhere between five and 10,000 hogs per facility. Uh, folks that don't know much about factory farms, they come with a slew of problems, uh, both environmental and others. Uh, in the United States uh, today, over the last 30 years, we've lost 300,000 farmers uh, in the industry. Uh, we always say lost, like we can't find them. <laughs> we know where they went, which was uh, the uh, economic system that's been structured by the major players has essentially created an unequal playing field for most farmers, especially in the livestock industry. Uh, today, uh, to raise hogs for market, for example, you generally have to do so under these things called output contracts, where you move from being an independent livestock farmer to being a employer or a contractor for some of the larger corporations. Uh, you sign a contract that basically signs your operation away. So everything from daily feeding schedules to vaccination schedules to even the title, who holds the title to the animals that you're raising. So some of these contracts, the title to the live animal is held by the corporation, but once the animal dies, it transfers to the farmer for disposal of the dead animal. So there's all kinds of degrees of control in this factory farm, vertically integrated farming system. So folks in Pennsylvania didn't think these factory farms were such a good idea from either an environmental standpoint or from an economic standpoint. And uh, they were faced with a couple of hundred new hog factory farms coming into these five counties in South Central Pennsylvania. And the fascinating thing about the fight that evolved there, which gave birth to the democracy school that you're now in, so it's funny to think about it, the small communities of about 500 to 1,000 people, that's where all this started. And it was not liberal progressive communities. Uh, we're talking about a part of Pennsylvania that's thoroughly Republican, conservative, I mean, it's as, as red as it gets in that corridor of the rural T. Uh, and those are the folks that were calling us for help because they had laws in place that they had passed previously that actually governed uh, factory farms coming in to make it more expensive, almost so expensive to operate a factory farm in that area that they hoped that the regulations that they had put in place would make it too expensive for the corporations to come in factory farms. Uh, unfortunately for them is that when the corporations came in, and these are corporations like Hatfield Foods and Smithfield, you know, the big players in the industry, when they came into that part of Pennsylvania and they started meeting these regulatory ordinances that these small communities had passed, uh, instead of saying, oh, to those communities, you've exercised your democratic authority, you don't want us here, we're going to go someplace else, they went to the Pennsylvania legislature and they wrote a new law called the Nutrient Management Act. And the Nutrient Management Act, which was passed into law, signed by a Democratic governor, uh, preempted all of those local regulatory ordinances that were in place at the local level and put in a standard that was so permissive that anybody could put a factory farm anywhere that they wanted to in South Central Pennsylvania. So again, municipal communities, these townships came together, they passed these laws, corporations came in, mowed down the laws by passing a preemptive law at the state level that actually allowed them to crack open those municipalities to begin putting factory farms in. The elected officials in these small communities uh, came to us because they had nowhere else to turn. They didn't know what else to do because they had attempted to exercise lawmaking authority. Corporations had come in and overridden uh, those, that authority. Uh, and so the rest of the democracy school is about essentially the rest of tomorrow, mostly in the afternoon, is about what happened next, right? 
did these folks just give up and go home? Well, no, uh, they started doing something spectacular, uh, which gave rise to what we refer to as a re a basically a Pennsylvania revolt that's been going on for the past 10 years, in which communities in Pennsylvania have said, fuck you to the corporations coming in, and said we are going to, uh, in, in essence, seize democratic authority down to our municipal communities to say no to those things coming in. And what happened in Pennsylvania has now reverberated not only in Spokane, which gave birth to the Envision Spokane stuff and the initiatives that uh, that group has run here, has also spread to Colorado where communities have banned uh, fracking in different localities, uh, to Oregon where there's aerial pesticide spraying bans uh, in initiative form that Oregon counties are voting on, uh, GMO-free communities who are now using this structure of law uh, to actually try to ban uh, GMOs within their communities. We've taught these democracy schools in Nepal, uh, in Northern Ireland, in Australia, in different, you know, th those different locales basically coming out of that small cluster of communities in Pennsylvania. So the calls at some point where the communities were calling in saying, hey, we need help, and we would explain to them, well, you can't ban things in your community because that's against the law, but you can appeal the permits that are issued. Uh, the call started to change back in 2002, 2003 as these cluster of communities in Pennsylvania were beginning to do this work. And they started getting much tougher on us. So when we said, well, you can't ban this activity within your community because it's a legal use. Uh, and if you do so, you know, you're going to get sued. Uh, people in communities started asking a very tough question, which was why? Why can't we ban this and that that's harmful to us? Why can't we ban that from coming into the community? And we would say, well, if you attempt to ban it in your community, you're going to get sued. And you're going to get sued by corporations who are affected by that ban, just like if the city of Spokane tried to ban big box stores from coming in, you would get a lawsuit from one of the big box store corporations. That the corporation would come in and sue you. And in addition to suing you for violating their corporate rights under the law, constitutional rights, which you're going to look at in detail tomorrow morning, uh, they can also sue your community for damages based on future lost profits lost as a result of not being able to cite the project in the community. Okay? So if you're an elected official in one of these communities, uh, in some ways, if you pass a law and then the corporation sues and the law is overturned, it's nothing ventured, nothing gained. But the corporation can not only sue your community to overturn the law, they can sue your community for damages. So if you ban a frack well from the community, the corporation can sue you for the amount of frack gas that you've stopped the corporation from accessing within the community as a result of the ordinance, right? So the corporation can sue you not only to overturn the law, but also for damages for stopping the corporation from coming in, essentially for taking their property to which the elected officials on the other end of the phone would say, why? And we would say, well, corporations have constitutional rights in the United States, right? They are protected by constitutional rights. To which the question was, why, <laughs> right? And we'd say, well, originally the Constitution was interpreted to say that only you and I have constitutional rights, that real living, breathing persons have constitutional rights. But over the years, the US Supreme Court and other courts in the federal system and elsewhere have said that corporations are persons protected by the US Constitution's Bill of Rights. So they have First Amendment free speech rights, which allowed them to overturn the Citizens United case, overturn federal campaign finance laws. They have Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable search and seizures. It's why OSHA can't do unannounced inspections of workplaces anymore, because they need probable cause to do so. The Fifth Amendment is something called the Takings Clause. You're going to, guys are going to look at that ad nauseum tomorrow about how corporations are protected from their property being taken. And guess what? State and federal permits that corporations hold are property. They can be bought and sold. So if you interfere with the permit that's been issued, you have a takings lawsuit that can be brought against you on the basis of the corporation's Fifth Amendment rights. So corporations have these have this you know, collage of constitutional rights, which by virtue of their wealth that they also have, have more rights than you do or I do in our own municipality where we live. That's the story of, of that piece of constitutional rights. To which the voice on the other end of the phone would say, 
Why? <laughs> why? Why do they have those constitutional rights? Which begs a deeper conversation about how the system of law is built in the United States. We have a DNA called the Constitution. And most people, when they laud the Constitution, they talk about the Bill of Rights, how great the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment is, and they are. But we don't talk so much about the text of the Constitution. The text and structure of the Constitution is very anti-democratic. It's about elevating certain property and commerce rights above the rights of people, communities, and nature, which shouldn't be a surprise. It's a 1780s document. That's how people thought back then. The founders didn't know anything about deforestation or climate change or any of these issues. They wrote a document allowing for the exploitation of natural resources at the fastest clip possible. That's the DNA of the constitutional structure today, the text of it, not the Bill of Rights, but the text of it. It should come as no surprise that if you're protecting property and commerce with the core safeguarding protections of the constitutional DNA, that you're going to give those rights to the primary actors of property and commerce, which are the corporations. Corporate personhood is not a mistake. It's actually fundamentally part of that constitutional structure in the United States. To which the elected official on the other line would say, why is that? Right? Why was the Constitution built that way? And the answer is that our Constitution is built on something called English common law. Right? Our lawyers were bathed in English common law. It's what they knew. They thought the English system of law was the best thing since sliced bread, even though we had just broken away from them. They sought to replicate those components of English common law into the United States system, especially those folks who still were in love with England, like Alexander Hamilton, for example, who loved England and English law. So when you look at the US Constitution, all those principles are in there. And we have to understand that English common law developed at the worst time, which was colonization time, when England and Portugal and Spain and all the colonizing countries were not only taking over the Caribbean and other countries and cultures, but also taking a system of law and superimposing it on those colonies. And that system of law that they were in superimposing was full of violence. It was full of the worst stuff you can imagine because it was all about subjugating those native peoples to a superstructure of law. And that superstructure of law was English common law. You guys are going to examine that ad nauseum tomorrow as well. So if a corporation is a person, we as persons are subject to capital punishment. Are corporations subject to capital punishment? Yes, we have something called charter revocation, which we'll talk about as well. But that somewhat evades we were big proponents of charter revocation for a while, but it somewhat evades the question, which says there are good companies and bad companies. I would posit to say, I would suggest, that it's not what corporations do illegally today, it's what corporations do legally. Because they have the power to actually change the fabric of law. So it's not what they do to violate the law, it's actually what they do because of the law, within that system of law. So I was having conversations with the elected officials and these people in rural Pennsylvania communities, they would say, finally, why? Right? Why is that? Why is it structured that way? And we'd say, we, I don't know. You know. It goes back to the Nile. It goes back to human something, something, something. I don't know. But you guys are stuck in this process right now. It's very complex. It's very complicated. And almost nobody knows how it works. When people come up against a factory farm coming into their community, when they come up against a toxic waste incinerator coming into their community, they have no idea how the system actually functions. The system of law works in the United States because it is so camouflaged so that so few people see it. Because my belief is that if enough people understood how the system actually functioned, that we would have a revolt of fundamental proportions in the United States because people would refuse to live under it. But it is a system that is not democratic. And uh, I think folks in communities, when they run up against these things, they're the only ones that it becomes relevant to because they learn how the system is not democratic. Because we need to understand how it's structured to be able to dismantle it. Because the system that we have today is not sustainable. It's part of the engine that's driving environmental collapse, ecological degradation, I mean, all the stuff that we've been talking about. And it didn't begin with Trump. Okay. <laughs> It goes way back before Trump. Trump may be the most blatant excuse for a man uh, and, and one of those guys that makes it crystal clear on certain fronts. But make no mistake about it, during the Obama administration, this system of law operated as well. 
And in fact, the day before Citizens United was issued by the US Supreme Court, things weren't so peachy in the United States either. So we have to ask ourselves, how far back do we want to go and how far deep do we want to dig? And the question is, do we have to dig all the way down to get rid of the bad stuff to actually build something new? Or does it come back to bite us if we don't go deep enough to cut the cancer out? Because this place has a lot of it. Uh, and for communities to actually be free to ban things and say exactly what they want, uh, that system of law has to come out. So, democ yeah, Dina. So I have two quick questions, I hope. When did that law come into effect about corporations? Corporations having constitutional rights? Yeah. Uh, goes all the way back to the early 1800s, a case called Dartmouth, so 1807, 1812, and then was laid into place brick by brick until the U.S. Supreme Court decided something called Santa Clara in 1886, mm -hmm. uh, and that's been the law ever since. Okay. Yeah. The second one was who determines legal use? Yes. I mean, yeah. Right now the courts decide that. But if you have a permit to do something, and even if you don't have a permit, but it's not a nuisance or something that runs afoul of the law in other ways, it's deemed to be a legal use by the courts. So you're in that place. So just to finish up, because I've been speaking for a while, but to say the democracy school is about how to understand this stuff. Because right now, the only folks that understand this stuff and are playing on that playing field are the lawyers and the judges and the corporate lawyers, and they laugh at you. I've been on phone calls with the corporate lawyers, legal counsel, they laugh at communities because when, you, when a community is affected by something, the first thing that people do is call the, call the environmental agency or they call the corporation that's proposing the project because they have no clue what the torpedo is that's about to hit them in the community. The fascinating thing about the way our system of law works and the worst thing about it is you don't run into the corporation first, the corporation that's proposing the project, you don't run into them first you run into your own structure of law first, right? Because the corporation can't do what it wants to do in your community, except that it's enabled and empowered by the system of law to do it. So part of the democracy school is looking at those doctrines, where they come from and how corporations, how corporations use it. And the final thing I'll say before I shut up uh, is that um, there's lots of history to the democracy school. These guys are going to do a lot of talking over the next however many hours you have together, nine hours together, eight hours together. Uh, the, the democracy school is full of a lot of history because it's relevant. It is relevant to understanding what we do next. We can't have the conversation about what we do next without understanding that full history. Half the people in the democracy schools will write us comments that say, there's too much history, we need more activism. The other half of people that come to democracy schools will say, we need less activism and we need more history. You're gonna fall somewhere in that spectrum. Uh, but a democracy school is intended to pull those components out. It's intended to excite you because guess what? We're not the first people to have done this. The abolitionists and the suffragists, other people in this system who are not treated as people but treated as property, actually were able to pull themselves out and make some of the most basic fundamental constitutional change that this country has ever seen. I'm in a position where my opinion is that we need a new constitution. We need a basic new governing document that can take us into sustainability. The document that we have now doesn't do the trick. Uh, how we get there, of course, is part of the journey that you're going to take over the next eight hours. So, thank you.